Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us from. My name is Fanyol Mwindi and I'll be your host today. Um, welcome to SAFLO C5 Pitch Day. Super excited to have you. Um, I can't believe some um, 10 weeks have gone by super fast. I'm looking at all the fellows uh, like they just joined us yesterday and they were like, oh my goodness, here we are. Um, I am the founder and chief resident here at SAI. And at SAI, we're an incubator that provides infrastructure training, mentorship, and funding to enable and accelerate the building of new tools, research, programs that expand pathways of access between science and society. That's really what at the core we are focused on. Our residents work on diverse projects. Um, I encourage you to take your phones out right now scan that QR code on the bottom right there and head over to our website and you can filter all the different projects that people are doing. And here's a snapshot of them, quite a lot of them. Uh, so I encourage you to go uh, to the link here or the, UR, uh, the QR code on the right to visit us uh, and learn about these wonderful project, projects that they're working on. At the core of it is the SAI Fellows Program. Our program is 10 weeks. Uh, we provide one-on-one -one mentorship to graduate students, postdocs, or fellows, and also practitioners out, out there in the community, and provide them with seed funding, infrastructure, mentorship over a period of 10 weeks. And we take their ideas from really the formative stages um, all the way through to uh, launch, which is today. Um, and so through this, they work through what we call the logic model. And I think a lot of them, hopefully they're not too sick of hearing the word logic model at this time, but it is a wonderful mechanism to be able to organize your thoughts and think through the logic and the, and the connections that exist, whether in your programs, your career, and many, many other ways, uh, things that you're trying to do uh, in your life. So they go through a lot. And this is the quick, quick snippet of all the presentations that have gone through guest speakers. Uh, we go through um, marketing, we go through inclusive building, we go through funding, the whole spiel. And the mentors really emphasize. And throughout all this, the, the fellows are building the programs um, as we go. The C5 fellows were exceptional. They came to us from all around the world. Uh, and it's amazing to just see the diversity of all the projects and also uh, the locations. Um, and so we're just amazing. Thank you for those who are joining us uh, from faraway lands out there, uh, the fellows as well. Uh, appreciate that. Big thanks to our mentors, Matt, Brittany, Jessica, Sarah, Gorlovlin, Maria. Um, I thank you so much for agreeing to join us again on this uh, wild ride and providing the mentorship to our fellows. Um, couldn't have done it without you. And special thanks as well to Noel, Claire, Bree, you guys. Um, thank you so much uh, for just all everything you, you're doing and have done uh, to help us get here. Guest speakers, Prasha, Joanne, Amy, Valerie, for providing your ad expert advice uh, to the fellows. And our sponsors, STEM peers, uh, BWF, huge thanks to you, BWF, Adgene, uh, and all our individual donors that made this possible. Special thanks as well to our three judges today, Pete Volbrecht, Assistant Professor in the Department of Biomedical Sciences, at Western Michigan University. And he's also our SAI senior resident. And he was actually our first fellow that joined us at SAI. So it was wonderful to see him come back and as a mentor as well. Nita Paré, uh, founder, CEO, and director of programs at Innovate Social. She's also on the advisory board at SAI. Thank you so much for agreeing to uh, be a judge today. And Stephanie Castillo. Uh, PhD candidate in science communication uh, at Vanderbilt University, among many, many things that she does, uh, even more recently, a AAAS Mass Media Fellow. Congratulations for that. Um, really check them out there on their Twitter profiles um, as well. So today, today we're going to have some fun, okay? Uh, the fellows are each going to have five minutes to pitch their presentations. And then if time allows, and if they're good on their time, uh, judges will be able to ask one question after each presentation, if time allows. So we've broken them up, them up in two groups. Uh, the first five will go, and then we'll open up Q&A here for those of us that are in the Zoom room. Um, and for those of us who are live streaming as well, you can drop your questions in the chat. It'll be tough to get through all the questions. It will be tough, I'll repeat that. It's gonna to be tough. So we're gonna to be very selective. Um, so, so apologies in advance for that. 
Um, the goal today really is to get through all the presentations, uh, have the judges um, ask the question that they need to ask, and be able to pick our top two pitches today. Okay, so hopefully we'll get through all of that. Drop your questions in the chat. Um, and please make sure you mute yourselves uh, if you're not speaking um, as well. And um, at the end here, please make sure you leave us some feedback. We really appreciate that. Um, so take your phones out right now again and scan that QR code there. We will drop and Brie, if you can drop the link um, to the review sheet, uh, not the review sheet, the, um, the feedback form later in the chat. So keep an eye on that as well for those who are live stream, uh, watching this through live stream. Okay, and so, and, 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 and special news, if you stay put till the end, okay, way after we announce the uh, top two pitches, there's a special announcement that I like to make regarding the cohort six, all right? So with that, I want to uh, welcome our first presenter, Amanda. The floor is yours, Amanda. <laughs> Okay, sorry, it would it just let me mute unmute. So it won't let me screen share yet though. Okay, here we go. Okay, can everyone hear me and see my slides? Awesome. Scientist teacher, student, woman, lower middle class, and Italian heritage. These are all multiple aspects of our identities that can tell our stories as scientists. But these words don't just describe any scientist, they describe me. I'm Amanda Coletti, and in addition to these identities, I have a background in neuroscience, I'm a current PhD student in communication and a college instructor, and I'm also a science communicator and storyteller. And I'm really passionate about helping people to train scientists to tell better stories about their research and experiences in STEM. However, in our society and in the fields of STEM, there are many contributing problems such as lack of representation, academic culture, systemic racism, and even individual factors such as self-esteem and the way that we see ourselves. But the specific problem that I'm going to address is the lack of communication training for STEM graduate students, particularly students in minoritized groups who have been historically underrepresented in STEM fields. So the solution that I'm proposing is to design and evaluate an entirely virtual storytelling training pro program specifically for minoritized STEM grad students. And this four week program focuses on three main training modules, STEM identity, storytelling and strategic communication. And it'll culminate in a virtual STEM storytelling showcase where participants will tell their final STEM stories in front of a virtual audience. And in order to determine the impact of the program, we'll administer a survey before and after the program to measure changes in STEM identity, self-efficacy, confidence, contact knowledge, and more. And finally, participants will be able to leave the program with two tangible deliverables, a video recording of their story and a, a strategic communication plan for disseminating their story. And in looking at the landscape analysis, there are other organizations that do offer communication training for scientists. However, many are focused more broadly on communication in general and not storytelling, but even those that do focus on storytelling like the Ellen Alda Center or the Story Collider, while they are great organizations, their programs are very location specific, especially pre-pandemic, and can be expensive, upwards of $100. And we know grad students are already tight on budgets and have massive time demands. So my program offers many benefits by making the program free to grad students, is entirely virtual to fit into those busy schedules. It focuses on grad students of specifically minoritized groups and it openly addresses identity as a core value. 
So at the very start of developing this project, I wanted to start with an audience centered approach and ask my target audience of grad students for some feedback on my program. So I developed and distributed an online survey via social media, and we ended up with 21 responses. And while I have more data than I have time to share today, I'll show some of the major findings. So in confirming our problem statement, we found that only about 18% of our sample received formal communication training, which means that about 80% don't receive formal communication training and either aren't getting any or have to search for it in informal ways. We also found that 81% of participants were willing to sign up for the program, which was great. And when we asked if there were any barriers uh, that they perceived for signing up, the two biggest factors were time and money. So in order to address the grad students' concern of money, I want to make this program free for grad students to enroll. So this program will use a nonprofit funding model. And my next steps will be to apply for a nonprofit status and also apply for grant funding, which I've already identified um, some potential grants from the NSF, the Kavli Foundation, and the Society for Science. And my other next step is to develop a team for this program. So I'll start to recruit volunteers to build up my team of trainers and facilitators uh, to help navigate these online workshops. And with that, I'd love for you all to start following the STEM identity storytelling on Twitter and on Instagram, where I'll be posting some STEM stories and some developments for the program as they roll out. And please feel free to reach out by email as well. So thank you all for listening and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Fantastic. Um, I think that was Blitzkrieg and I really appreciate Amanda for uh, sticking on the time. Uh, judges, uh, you guys have a, a question that you can ask uh, Amanda. And feel free to unmute yourself and ask if there is a question from the judges. Okay, no question there. Oh, Peter is saying can't unmute. Sorry, Peter. Um, okay, go for it, Peter. How about now? Yeah, there, there you go. Okay. Um, so I love this idea, it's really great. And I would have been one of those people who said that I didn't really receive formal communication training either uh, in graduate school. Um, I'm curious if you defined that in any way for them as, as to what that actually was. Like, I think some people would have argued that I did receive it because they, you know, told me at some point that like, this is how you're supposed to do it real briefly after I gave a presentation or something. Um, so I'm curious if you defined what formal actually meant for them. Um, and then I'm going to sneak two questions in. Um, also curious how after grant funding um, sustainability of the program would be maintained. Right, yeah. So I think that in creating the survey, that was one of the things that we wanted to be very explicit about. I think um, in terms of defining formal STEM or formal communication training, I would define it as like part of a program and not just, you know, casual advice given afterwards. Um, but that is something that, you know, next rounds of surveys and, and continuing on, we can parse that out a little bit more clearly as well. And for sustainability, um, there, I have a, a several plans similarly to SAI setup of um, continuing to, you know, evaluate the program and, and improve on it um, gradually as it goes along, maybe do some guest speakers from previous alumni of the program to, to continue it going that way. Great. Great. Um, so Amanda, please feel free to answer any additional questions in the chat. Um, uh, and we'll keep moving here and there'll be more chances for Q&A later as well. So don't worry if you didn't get sque squeeze the question in right now, there'll be more chances later. Uh, up next, uh, Caroline. Welcome. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. All right, great. Hi, 
My name is Caroline, and today I'm going to talk about my project, Museum Scenes, where we're going to bring more voices into SciCon eight pages at a time. A little quick um, aside about me, I am a postdoc in biology at Harvard University. I am also a comics and zine artist. Zines are just little booklets of words and pictures. You can see some on my table here. And my goal is also Museum Zine's goal, which is to bring more perspectives into SciCon. So why museums? They're this classic site, right, for informal science education. I love going to museums when I was a kid, and I still do. And it wasn't until um, grad school that I realized that what you see in the public museum is simply the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more to a museum. There's so many more activities happening behind the scenes that we don't actually share with visitors. Now, Harvard, literally the collections are just sub-basements below. <laughs> So the standard museum model is that scientists use these collections to generate knowledge. And then designers will take that knowledge and they'll create exhibits for the public. But these kind of activities, you know, they're not offered during museum visits and not typically offered during programming. So we just hope that visitors come and, you know, they, they, some, they take away something from these exhibits. I argue that uh, these are lost opportunities for engagement and teaching STEAM skills. Why don't we teach students what the scientists and designers are doing? And also the perspectives of students and their communities are missing from the museum itself. They walk away with whatever they thought and what they saw. So museum zines pitches a more inclusive museum model. Can we have students give them access to these collections. And this can happen both virtually, there's great repositories of specimens online, also in person, and then have them interact with a real life scientist, a real life artist, and create content from self-directed inquiry. And finally, leave some of what they made in the museum itself. And the Harvard Museum of Natural History has already agreed to exhibit uh, what comes out of these workshops, what comes out of um, from the students. So what kind of content will this be? Well, there'll be zines. And I just wanted to quickly touch on the power of zines. Uh, there's a low barrier to entry. You can make a zine, a great zine from just a piece of paper and a pencil. They're a great tool for synthesizing information and building visual communication skills. What is a PowerPoint? What is a scientific poster, but a juxtaposition of, of images and words? And, um, oh, and also I wanna say that for this age group, uh, middle school students, which is the target. Um, zines, comics is the, one of the only growing sectors of print media right now. It's really popular for this age group. I want to keep these work for these um, zines. Uh, they're going to happen during these standalone workshops. They're going to happen over a day, and I want to keep them free. So where are the where where are the funds coming from? Well. Or from SAI, thank you. Um, from merch sales, I wanna make prints, I wanna make sticker packs and pins, and you can buy bundles of these and then purchase a seat for a student in one of these workshops, as well as donations. And these costs will go towards paying scientists and artists honoraria, buying the art supplies, and then merchandise production costs. Progress so far, um, well, I am I very connected with educators to survey student interests. Um, and also I'm building a little bit of a web presence for us. Um, you can follow us on Instagram at Museum Zines. I'm also building a science zine library and building and writing up workshop protocols so that people can take these protocols and then do these workshops elsewhere. And uh, as a team, the Museum of Natural History has already agreed to host and advertise the workshop to students. Um, there are many interested scientists and artists collaborators. And I also have volunteers for prototyping the work workshops. So what's next? Yep, we've got a prototype. I'm still seeking guest scientists and artists, so you know, hit me up. And uh, for annual, maybe an essay follows online shop for merch and gear, think about it. And I um, lastly want to thank Fanuel, the meta mentor, and Sarah, my direct mentor. And here's where you can follow me. So thank you very much. Fantastic. Um, judges, we have one question uh, from either three of you. Feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, I might jump in. Um, thanks so much for that presentation. What, what do you envision the world to look like if 
your if your organization or your project is successful and scales, how would the world be different with more zines? So I was going to a lot of comics and zine conventions. I what I don't really see is like science actually entering people's personal stories. Um, and so I would just love to see more of that. I would like to see people of various backgrounds, various walks of life actually um, sharing how science is a, is a part of who they are or of how it affects their lives. So um, that's really what I would love to see. And I would love to see that when you go to the library in your classroom or go to a bookstore, you know, you can get so many other perspectives um, through this visual media. And I mean, I love other types of media too, but this one is closest to my heart. So I love to see that. Yeah, and Carolina, I like the idea of the merch store essay. I have something to think about. Yeah, sure. yeah, okay. Yes. <laughs> we can talk. Uh, Caroline, thank you so much. We're going to continue this discussion a little bit later. Um, so up next, uh, Jackie uh, Wissanant. And I keep forgetting to say where you're all from. Uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, Jackie, please uh, welcome. Thank you very much. All right. All right. So hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you to Fenwell and the SAI Experience for this educational and affirming opportunity. I'm Jackie Wisnant, an illustrator and educator with a fondness for insects and other unsung ecological heroes of our world. Now, I didn't always like insects. Not many people do in general. It's societally reinforced in many aspects of Europeanized culture. Other than charismatic insects like butterflies and honeybees, insects that aren't directly reviled are simply ignored or unnoticed for the most part. A large part of this disconnect comes down to exposure and education. We want more students to discover entosciences at an earlier age. So often I hear the lament in college ento classes, oh man, I wish I'd heard about this earlier. This was such a fun class. I'm so sad I'm graduating. So let's, let's reach earlier than undergrad and start that in high school. So if you're thinking middle school age, people aren't really thinking about their careers yet. School is still something that's looming ahead of them. They still have ages and ages, a whole four years to go. <laughs> and upper high school students have already self-selected as scientists or not scientists generally in, in their own kind of personal perspective. But ninth and 10th grade, science is still mandatory. We still have them in our clutches and we can show them what, what insects are like and how cool they are. <laughs> so, for high school educators, we have developed modular curricular activities to serve as an insect fieldwork experience that can be easily plugged into a unit on ecology, serve as an extra credit exploration, something that students can engage with uh, organismal science in a way that doesn't require you to have an entomologist in your back pocket. This insect exploration will function like a choose your own your adventure where students take control of their journey and have a sense of agency in their own experience. A series of branching pathways lead to an endpoint microhabitat where students find and collect photos of insects to bring back to the lab to identify. So this is a quick experience of what this will look like. It's con composed of a photographic journey through a walk in the woods or an urban setting or another environment with points where students can investigate a little closer or continue onward and continue on their way. All the insects that they find would be you know, put into their pack and brought back to identify with a provided field guide and, and resource that would allow them to reach a certain level of identification, whether it's order or family. They would then pair this guided experience with a real exploration in a local, easily accessible community, again, whether it's on their walk to school, some, something where they can potentially encounter an insect. And insects are everywhere. They genu genuinely are. You just have to know where to look. And this helps you figure out where. There are resources like Bug Guide and iNaturalist, which are really fascinating and wonderful um, places for ecologists and naturalists to communicate about the insects that they've found and identify and, and have that, that place of uh, communication. But in order to use these resources, you need to know where to look to record your observations. So this is bridging that gap between I'm interested in animals or in something uh, and then being able to use these resources in a more meaningful way. Students working through this series of identification adventures will have an increased awareness and investigation of outdoor spaces as they notice microhabitats that they would have otherwise ignored without this 
close investigative experience. And they can more easily identify as a scientist with the confidence in their own growing skills as they do science through exploration. This will also practice STEM skills like field work and field collection using identification keys and having those conversations with their fellow, stu fellow students. So far through the guidance of the SAI program, um, we've generated a preliminary PDF format of this. So there's a physical version that is more accessible to classrooms that don't necessarily have uh, technological accessibility for all students, maybe, maybe not reliable internet access, but um, so having a couple versions for, for teachers to engage with. And uh, what's coming up in the future would be expansion to a virtual po actual point and click experience. I will be presenting this to the North Central Branch Entomological Society of America, big mouthful meeting that is uh, coming this June to have a call for collaboration so that entomologists across the country could potentially submit exploration guides or exploration photos to turn into these types of guides. So there's a broader range of ecological experiences. The generous seed funding has provided a better camera for gathering these images and resources for preliminary setup like website registration, um, Creative Cloud access to develop these, these resources. I am also applying for the Chrysalis Fund, which is due June 1st. This is through the Entomological Society of America, and it's a grant program specifically for designing and implementing K-12 entomological educational activities. So I think this fits right into that. Um, and this will allow for funds to fully realize the point and click experience. And um, this resource will be provided for free to any educator to encourage entomological expansion of career opportunities for their students. I'll be working with Dan Young. My, he's my advisor at UW-Madison. He's a phenomenal educator whose enthusiasm is infectious and in what brought me to the master's degree in entomology in the first place. And then also Julia Janecki, who I've collaborated with on interactive infographics. And so she has the experience behind um, coding and making that interactive experience a reality. With that, thank you so much for your attention. Please let me know if you have any questions. All right, Jackie, uh, judges, um, she is all yours. Hi, Jackie, great presentation. I'm curious how you plan to distribute this or like, how do you get, how are you, what is your plan on getting educators like this product into the educator's hands? For sure. It'll be, um, right now, I'm working with a network of um, local educators, so ninth and 10th grade science teachers through Madison. Um, I have personal connections to some educators and they have spread the word throughout their, <laughs> their cohorts. Um, so a lot of word of mouth is really necessary for this very preliminary part, but um, website, website accessibility and, um, and pr providing the, the resources through a centralized website, but then reaching out again through educational outreach um, gatherings, or the, the conferences, conferences in science education. So. Awesome, thank you. Of course, thank you. Great, um, Peter had said that uh, in the chat there, could you also create a template that would allow students to create their own pathways that may be submitted and possibly selected for further development into a pathway that you place on your webpage? I love that a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much, Peter. Yes, a hundred percent. I think that would be ph phenomenal. Fantastic. Jackie, thank you so much. Uh, stick around for sure. Um, there'll be some new questions, I'm sure, from other people. Um, okay, we're moving along here really well. Thank you, everybody. Uh, up next is John from Tel Aviv University. Uh, can everybody hear me well? Yes. Okay, so. In a world full of noises, how does it feel to be heard? In a world full of inequality, how does it feel to be given the opportunity to speak up? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Giancarlo J. Combista, and I'm here to present to you my project entitled Hear This Ability. Just a little bit of a background about myself. So I am a registered pharmacist from the Philippines, but I'm currently doing my Master of Science in Medical Sciences Research, majoring in neuroscience here at the Sackler Faculty of Medicine in Tel Aviv University, Israel. After I graduate my 
From my master's, I plan to pursue PhD in neuroscience to study more about neurodevelopmental disabilities. According to the World Bank, 1 billion people or 15% of the world's population experience some form of disability, either invisible or visible disabilities. First, on, a, on average as a group, are more likely to experience socioeconomic outcomes than persons without disabilities. It seems that the world is slowly opening to the diversity in general, but disability is quite excluded from that because although representation is so important now, people seem to talk about everything except disability. Same scenario goes into the field of STEM. The underrepresentation of people with disabilities is evident in both STEM training programs and the workforce. Research reveals that people with disabilities experience a lower level of career success than those without disabilities. They're less likely to attend college, pursue STEM majors, and earn degrees, and are more likely to get discriminated because of the stigma, culture, environment, and other factors that they're in. Taken together, there are approximately 75% fewer individuals uh, in the STEM workforce than in the general population. However, the success stories of quite a few individuals with disabilities in the field of STEM demonstrate that opportunities still do exist. If they're prepared to face the adversities that they may face in their pursuit of STEM related fields. Having their stories freely available online and in different platforms is beneficial to those people with disabilities who are keen to pursue STEM in college, but are looking for a community of people with such disabilities to look up to in order to turn their self doubts into home and inspiration. Although there are already several organizations such as these organizations that are addressing issues about representations of disabled individuals through letting their stories be heard, but I noticed that there is a lack of a central community among creators of several platforms, as well as those who are disabled individuals in STEM who are looking for different platforms to tell their stories. This makes it hard for the creators to find disabled individuals to write their stories in their platforms while at the same time, difficult for individuals with disabilities who are willing to share their stories to connect to the creators. This is where my project, Here Disability, bridges the gap. Here Disability is a project that serves as a central community hub to bridge and connect disabled individuals in STEM who are looking for opportunities to amplify their voices through storytelling to organizations or creator storytelling platforms. For this project, what makes this unique is that I plan to focus on specific geographical location race, ethnicity, gender, culture, religion, etc., so that I can reach out to as many people as possible across the globe and give importance to or emphasis to diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. I have tried to reach out to several organizations where I also advocate for people with disabilities, as well as those people with disabilities that are already successful in the field of STEM. And these are just a few of their responses and I asked about them, their opinion regarding my project. And I am so much grateful for their positive feedback and online support. I have also created the website, Slack channel, Twitter, and Gmail accounts. And as a nonprofit project or organization, the funding models that I thought that would best suit the pur purpose of the project are through grants, donations at an individual or corporate level, and sponsorships from the collaborators and different organizations that have aligned goals as my project. And aside from me, this would not be possible if it weren't for the all out support of the SA Fellowship Program, as well as my mentors, Britain Green and Final Me. And moving forward, I plan to finalize the contents of the website, the user experience, and step by step processes. Afterwards, I plan to follow up with the collaborators or creators to establish an official agreement. And then I will launch the project as soon as possible. And to get things started, I will also follow up with the disabled individuals in STEM, whom I reached out to before to share and publish their stories. And then I will reach out to as many creators and disabled individuals in STEM as possible to let them join the community to share their stories and forge connections and build relationships. And from there, I plan to do some evaluation through surveys or polls to see how I can improve the project. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. If you have any questions or would like to connect or reach out, um, just feel free to contact me with this email address. Stay safe and happy, everyone. All the best. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that presentation, John, uh, John, and and also thank you as well for you know giving this presentation today. You know you, we know the situation over in Tel Aviv at the moment, so um, thank you uh, for that. Uh, judges, do you have any questions?
Um, yeah, I can jump in if there's not other question. Oh, sorry, Peter, go ahead. I just see yes, you yeah, unmuted. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna. I I really love this idea, and I think um I, I think it's a, a really important thing that that you're trying to put together here. I'm curious, um, what what types of stories just that you're asking them to tell just their their own stories and how they got to there or um, stories about the science that they're doing um, I, I guess I'm curious a little bit more about what those stories would be that you're asking people to tell oh, yeah so I was also like thinking already so um, I'm, I'm and aside from that I will do the some kind of like um, questions um, that they can follow as well so um, the, the stories I guess it I wanted to like know more about like how is it growing up with disabilities and like um especially when you are like wanted wanting to pursue STEM but like you don't have someone who can like encourage your mentor and how like the struggles and the adversities that they're facing like um in their education and what may uh what made them pursue um despite their despite their disabilities what made them pursue this STEM career um, is it because they have like um, uh, the mentors who inspire them or the support of the family? And if they can get to get like um, from their struggles to being successful in the field of STEM, then I guess that will also be very inspiring for those who are keen to pursue, who are in high school maybe, and keen to pursue STEM, but um, kind of like having self-doubts because that's how they grow. And I've tried to reach to so many um, uh, so many. Uh, professionals now, like for example, a professor from Johns Hopkins University, and she's willing to um, write a story. And that is like, she will, she had, she grew up with a, vis a vision impairment. And now she's now a professor trying to solve visual impairment uh, in her research. And she's a profession um, in epidemiology and public health. And that's kind of like really inspiring if she can write it and then people out there can can really um, listen. And, and not only for those who are um, those who are uh, disabled individuals, but also for those like herself, for us that are um, people with without disabilities to learn more about their day-to-day -day struggles. And so we can understand more about their life and because we just need to get educated, I guess. We just need to understand how they're going through. Nita, did you have a quick question? Um, I just put it in chat in case we're low on time. But, yeah, um, um, yeah, that's great. Uh, so John, if you can answer Nita's question in the chat, that'll be great. Um, and uh, so we're making really good progress here. Um, up next is uh, Kate. So what will happen after Kate's presentation, um, the general Q&A will open up for everybody. So the other presenters, please just get ready for that. While the judges, this would be a good reprieve for the judges to go and process the first five presentations and enter your scores in the sheet. Um, so with that, uh, Kate. Is Kate. All right, Kate, are you with us? Oh, let's see here, maybe. Yeah, you should be able to share your screen. Sorry about that, guys. First, first technical glitches of the day, I guess, are mine. Oh, none at all. It's all good. <laughs> Uh, sorry about this, guys. I'm getting a lot of lag in my machine suddenly. Um, okay. Are you guys able to see that? Yes. Cool. Okay. So I'm Kate Thompson. I am presenting Courageous Coders, and this is my solution to bring programming content to underrepresented adult learners in uh, and to get them uh, slated for career trajectories using programming skill sets. 
And uh, this, <laughs> so just learn to code is a phrase that I kind of love and hate, right? This is, it, it summarizes this ethos around uh, how programming and coding skills are this launch pad that can bring people into these really high profile careers. And it's produced this plethora of learning resources to get people who have no programming backgrounds into coding. And I love that energy and all of the development that's happened in that space. It's also really targeting traditional student learners and uh, it's excluding a lot of people. I think not through, uh, through for lots of reasons. I think, I think this problem is related primarily to conflating availability, availability with accessibility. And I would say that the key differences here are that, you know, obviously if something is free and online, it is available. This is different from accessible. If it's accessible, I think that this has to be a targeted offering that is brought to the intended audience where they're already at. Uh, and so the build it and the they will come approach, I think is just, it's wrong. And uh, this has produced a lot of new platforms that are targeting kind of the same people who are already self-selecting into STEM fields and coding careers. And this is uh, a, a brief rundown of some of the bigger players that I've worked with in, uh, in the coding space. And maybe you, if people are programmers, you might already know some of these, uh, the data camps, the edX's, the, Co the Coursera's, um, these are paid platforms uh, that might have some free offerings, but even at the introductory content level, they begin, you begin to run into paywalls. And so this is the first barrier to access that I think needs to be, it's pretty straightforward. Um, there's also a grab bag content model that is, I think, fine for people with some experience. If you know what you're looking for, you can definitely navigate these spaces and get what you need. If you are starting from square zero, good luck. It is, you're gonna waste a lot of time trying to figure out just what exactly you're looking for before you can even start assessing whether, you, whether it's good content or not. I think a step above this is in the like maybe hard to use category, but free content. And so free code camp, data carpentry, Women Who Code, these are examples I think of really great content that is 100% free, but it still relies on this grab bag model um, where people are kind of, it's kind of self-delivered. Um, I think a better example is Girls Who Code because they're delivering both a curated, complete and structured lesson plan in the space where girls are, specifically the, the clubs that they, that they have situated in schools. I think that courageous coders can be this model, but for adult learners. And um, yeah, so this is, uh, this is a conceptual diagram outlining uh, where investment barriers are kind of constraining who can access coding trajectories. Uh, and this is just to highlight that it's videos and meetup groups that I think have the lowest barriers to entry for people with zero coding backgrounds. And uh, that's where I'm hoping we can make a mark. So uh, my solution is Courageous Coders. And uh, I'm envisioning this project as the synthesis of our technical training at an introductory level with what I'm calling coding life skills. And these are the kind of like strategic approaches that I learned the hard way in order to streamline my learning and become more efficient at sifting through like the huge amounts of content that are available and uh, hopefully reduce some of the pain that is in the, the early days of coding. Hopefully you can get the audio on this. This was the breakthrough that I wanna share with you. Coding is one skill set. Learning to code is a completely different skill set that no one seems to talk about. I wanna teach you both. So a little video clip from uh, getting started. Ooh, was, I wonder if I can advance This was now. the breakthrough Sorry, that I want to share with you. Coding. We'll get there. 
Okay, the, <laughs> so how do we implement this? This is the International Institute of Minnesota. And I am so excited to say that I have, I'm launching a pilot with their College Readiness Academy program. This is a, so the Institute as a whole serves new Americans who are coming from around the world, but have recently attained American citizenship. And they're integrating in all kinds of ways. But the College Readiness program caters to adult learners who are going to be going to college for the first time. They don't have a STEM module in this course. I can be their STEM module. And so for two to three weeks, they've agreed, uh, two to three weeks in September, uh, they will pilot uh, Courageous Coders content with me. It'll be a kind of a captive audience for about 40 uh, of 40 students. And uh, those who take to the programming will continue on with me informally. Um, and hopefully this is, this is the, ma the marriage I'm hoping of like the audience that is like ready to choose their major and start selecting classes and a really positive experience in, uh, in introductory programming skills. So this is, uh, you can imagine a really diverse set of folks. Um, about 60% of the clients they serve come from Sub-Saharan African nations originally, and uh, about 20% are coming from East Asia or the Pacific, and about 10% are coming from Latin America or the Caribbean. And I've made a ton of progress, I think, in over the course of the 10-week fellowship. I made my first YouTube video, that was a cool thing. <laughs> I did a bunch of interviews with software development professionals, workforce development uh, folks, and adult educators. Uh, we put together the pilot and I launched the website. And as far as mon uh, future funding models, um, this is probably gonna begin with YouTube monetization. And if the audience can build and I can demonstrate traction, I would partner with recruiters and employers directly and provide paid trainings that meet their specific skill uh, talent deficits. And I would love to take questions. Please see the website. Wonderful, uh, Kate. Thank you so much. And for the previous presenters, if you did not put your website up there, you should drop it in the chat. Um, so Kate here, I think this is the first one I've seen uh, uh, along with John. Uh, thank you for sharing that link. So what I would like to do at this moment, uh, judges can, you, you guys can um, still definitely ask Kate questions, uh, but take a minute for yourself, maybe two or three minutes. We are running a little bit behind, uh, but I'd like to open up the floor for the first uh, five presenters to everyone. So if you just raise your hand, if you want to ask a question, uh, please do so at this time. And then I'll tell you to ask your question away or drop it in the chat. Um, so judges, maybe this hopefully gives you a quick break to, to process the first five before we jump into the second group. Uh, so the question floor is open. Um, people want to ask questions for the first five presenters. Can I ask a question, Fanwa? Yes, absolutely. OK, Kate, I really like this idea. I really love this idea. With YouTube monetization, you, I feel like you already have to have certain amount of hours and a certain amount of audience already captivated before you can get into that. So if you're, you know, trying to take up the space where Girls Who Code is in, is in like what other potential funders or what other, you know, people can you contact to kind of um, support your the, the growth of your business? So I think that having the captive audience is uh, I like really key to this, right? There's a few steps before I would anticipate really any funding stream at all. The, so I consider the, the collaboration with the International Institute of Minnesota very much in beta mode, right? I still have to like figure out how to make videos and like figure out if the audience that I think is there is really there. And if it is, then I think there's a, uh, I, I'm, I want to talk to veterans groups and there's a lot of workforce development institutions that are focused on specifically skilling up adults who are undergoing career transitions. And th this is kind of like, th that was the impetus for that punchline at the beginning of my talk, but oh, just learn to code. What do you mean you've been automated out of a job, right? There's a bunch of grant money to retrain folks um, to, do, to do this kind of, uh, to, to, get people into a new trajectory in the knowledge economy. Um, and so that, that could be a mix of grant grants, but I, I'm seeing primarily like institutions that are offline uh, that are not being served by Girls Who Code or by um, like the, the existing data camps and software carpentries and these kinds of 
uh, programming tutorial platforms. Um, they had kind of a build it and you'll come and they will come and that's true for 17 to 22 year olds who have already decided that they love computers. Um, for everyone else, you kind of have to like bring it to them. And I think that I think it's a real world audience. I think it's a it's an in person delivery to start. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, please, if you can keep your question brief and also uh, for those answering, try to be concise as much as you can. Um, uh, and yeah, we have another maybe one or two questions anybody wants to ask. Brie, was there a question from the chat that you wanted to read? Um, wasn't sure. As you look for one, I can I can pose a question to kind of everybody that's gone so far. One of the things that I think is really important, um, and I know having been a mentor in this program in the past, I wasn't this cycle. Um, I'm really curious about what success looks like and specifically how do I quantify success so that I can tell people about how great my program is and that they should give me money so that I can keep doing it. So I'm curious if people have specifically thought about that and what those measures might be. Yeah, so this, um, let's see, any, any of the first five can go. Um, I would, um, <laughs> I, I'll jump in and just say that um, through the International Institute of Minnesota, uh, there's, in, there's built in connections to the community colleges in the state. And uh, so they're very, they're very used to doing like a lot of the survey and evaluation metrics that we've talked about through the course of the fellowship. Um, and so by, you know, obviously there's like, everybody starts at the beginning, does two to three weeks, and then some fraction will continue with me. And um, those are the people who are also immediately able to plug in to formal education programs that um, we'll be able to have direct access to. So would success then be the number of people who actually go on to do that or how would you, okay. Yeah, so this is actually a very good point that uh, Pete knows the program really well. Uh, look into your logic models, you know them very well, your outputs and outcomes. And for those of you watching, uh, it's definitely a thing that we instill thinking about success. What does it mean? What are the metrics that you're gonna use, right? To assess it and change. So you're seeing the traction slides uh, that gives you a sentiment a little bit. Um, definitely contact them if you're really curious. They have way more they could present for an hour, guaranteed, okay? So we'd like to keep moving. Um, Morgan is up next. Morgan, welcome. Hello, everyone. Can you see and hear me? Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much. My name is Morgan DiCarlo, and I'm introducing my proposed initiative, See It, Be It, a civil engineering outreach program. Civil engineers design and maintain our civilization, a built environment including the roads we drive on, the buildings we live in, and the water we drink. Civil engineering is incredibly important to our society, However, civil engineers are retiring at a high rate with 20% growth in available jobs by 2022. There are simply not enough recruits to keep up with current openings in our field. And civil engineering has a devastating lack of diversity and persisting gender disparities. Recent statistics indicate that civil engineering is still 83% male and 71% white. Low recruitment and low diversity affects our ability to respond to emerging challenges. Not only are there not enough engineers for current job demand, we need even more talent to prepare for the future. We need to recruit diverse thinkers and train them with the engineer skills that are required to solve problems like the advanced age of the US's infrastructure and threats from climate change. We can solve the current unfilled positions and future demand by recruiting now from previously untapped diverse groups. We see infrastructure embedded into every aspect of our cities, but we rarely meet the civil engineers that are responsible for creating these resources. CFBA is an interactive speaker series that will start this summer and an accompanying website that houses a curriculum of CE outreach resources. 
Our mission is to introduce civil engineering early on as a career option to people from diverse groups. Our lunch structure is a pilot speaker series facilitated by myself. We will host six sessions via Zoom. The content will include a journal club style weekly reading about a civil engineering topic and career talks with real civil engineers. The cost will be free to attendees and our target audience segment is eighth and 10th graders, primarily women who are still in the exploration phase as far as college majors and are potentially really open-minded to choosing civil engineering as their profession. I analyzed the landscape in this area, and yes, the market is quite saturated with STEM ed programs, especially for young girls. However, see it be it is a bit unique in its mission to be specifically to highlight civil engineering careers. And in that space, there are several websites, video pages, and games about building and design. However, there is less interactive content where people can meet an engineer. In the upper right quadrant, we identify two competitors that have a similar structure to our program. However, both of these target college age or upperclassmen, uh, kind of placing them for jobs. CFB is a unique approach. First, the content will be facilitated by myself, an engineer, and also the speaker series will showcase female and diverse speakers and give the opportunity for students to meet them personally. At our core, we believe that if you can see it, you know how you can become it. I'm well suited to be effective in this space as a civil engineering PhD student and a researcher on issues related to aging water infrastructure. I'm very experienced in outreach in many capacities over the last nine years and have administered civil engineering content to more than 500 people, including events at the Intrepid Museum in New York City, five classrooms around the world as a Skype educator, and by founding and facilitating a brick and mortar version of this program at Stony Brook University from 2013 to 2016, which graduated more than 75 high school women. This program is the subject of my 2014 TEDx talk, led to my selection as one of America's new faces of civil engineering and received an honorable mention from Nature Magazine's award for inspiring science. In the evaluation of the pilot program that occurred at Stony Brook University, our first session, 28% of people who participated indicated civil engineering as an intended source of study in college, with comments including that civil engineering impacts real people and benefits them. Regarding the traction for See It Be It as we develop into a virtual space, our new website has been launched and we've confirmed speakers for at least two sessions this summer on topics in water quality and the registration form for summer is live. I have existing relationships with several STEM organizations. I've contacted these groups and plan to initiate some cross pollination and want to leverage their networks as a way to advertise this program and get our initial class of recruits. We have very low starting costs using Zoom, working with just a small group of recruits for the pilot class and with the volunteer speakers this session. As we grow, we will need to acquire our website domain, add sessions and potentially offer speaker and program facilitator stipends. Our approach will be largely grants based with the ultimate goal of becoming a nonprofit. Several grants such as Burroughs Welcome Fund from the NSF and for Science for Society are, are good options for us to target. I also hope to um, leverage some of my initial experiences by reapplying for the Motorola Solutions Innovation Generation Grant, which funded the Stony Brook University of this program and Nature Awards giving us an honorable mention. We anticipate good outcomes if I reapply to these organizations. Future work includes accepting the pilot group, booking dates with guest speakers, and taking the time to evaluate the effectiveness of this pilot program with pre and post surveys, iterating our website and content based on the feedback that we receive and applying for the nonprofit status. Thank you so much, especially to Sai and my mentor, Matt Wilkins with Galactic Polymath for your support. Here's a summary. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, judges, one question. Um, I might jump in. Um, my dad's a civil engineer, so this is awesome. Uh, this is good to see this. Um, my question is: I, I think you did a really nice job of outlining the problem. The solution to me, as a speaker series, I feel like there's something bigger, like a bigger vision than a speaker. So I'm, I'm kind of curious: how do you connect the dots to really address the problem that you outline? Yeah, absolutely. So. For me and my vast experiences in civil engineering um, at this point, the problem was um, I had no idea about what civil engineering was when I was a senior in high school. And I feel that I was really lucky to sort of discover it by chance 
I think um, even though this program would start small with the speaker series, the unique thing about it is that you would meet and have these kinds of simple conversations with engineers and it becomes achievable when you can meet someone. Um, I do think that there's uh, other ways this program can go grow. And that's why I have the accompanying website, which houses um, lectures, um, activities that I've created in the past and some lesson plans. And I think I could leverage some other connections I have like with Skype educators to continue to build this out and, and get a broader um, outreach for civil engineering curriculum content. But the speaker series as our pilot for the summer is just really near and dear to my heart to get people turned onto this concept in the first place. And I think the point there also, I think about your metrics, right? In your pre-post, what would be uh, Morgan in like a one or two cent, uh, <laughs> Uh, comment uh, response, what, what will be your KPI um, in your metrics? Yes, so um, our goal for the pre and post evaluations would be to uh, really just change it up after this program. So we wanna evaluate this summer what the students liked, what they didn't like, if they're responding to the readings. And one metric that I'm really interested in is whether they can reiterate or re um, when evaluated can respond about civil engineering accurately. Um, so that's that's what I want them to grasp from the summer because it helps me assess how the curriculum is working. Great. And that's something that for all of you watching and just about the program, the KPIs is something that I've drilled into all of them to try to extract from their outputs and outcomes. Uh, Morgan, there's some more questions in the chat. Please answer them in the, in, in the, in the chat. Thank you so much, Morgan. Uh, up next, Nasha from Pond Health Sciences University. I keep forgetting to mention the host university. Nasha, welcome. Thank you, Fadl. Can you all um, hear me and see my slides? Yes. All right. Thank you, my name is Neisha Martinez Orengo, and today I'm presenting Beastim Nista, Making Science Culturally Relevant. And as you can see here in the prototype logo, one of the main elements is the map of Puerto Rico. And that is because I am Puerto Rican. Here is this beautiful island uh, in the Caribbean. And although I am currently a postdoc uh, living in mainland US, both my bachelor and PhD degrees were obtained uh, from institutions in the island. But I want to take you back in time, like about 15 years or so, when I was attending the Josefa Vélez Bauza High School in Peñuelas, Puerto Rico. This is me here with my friends. And I have to say that at the time, uh, I, I knew that I loved science, but I would never imagine becoming a scientist. I didn't even know what a PhD was and the many career options that there are within STEM. But there was this one teacher um, who somehow she identified me in, in the school and she provided me an application for a summer research, in, research in, uh, internship. So by the end of that summer, I was able to uh, travel to NIH, National Institutes of Health, and present what I learned. So you can imagine that as a high schooler, that experience was extraordinary. And that was thanks to that one teacher. And you would think that maybe after 15, 20 years, there would be more STEM awareness and science would be taught in a more culturally relevant manner. However, that is still not the case. Vistimnista uh, surveyed several teachers in Puerto Rico and we asked them about the main limitations in the teaching process. Here we can see that 50 of them said that lack of resources is one of the limitations but then 75% of them actually identified the curriculum as not being adapted to students' needs and therefore being one of the most limiting factors. In terms of frequency of participation, collaboration, and integration of arts in STEM, 45% of them have never participated in a STEM program, 50% of them have never collaborated with teachers or other uh, schools, and 50% of them have never integrated arts in STEM. They also mentioned that only a uh, few times their students can identify a problem and realize that they, they can use the scientific method to solve those daily uh, problems. Their students also um, are not really aware of universities in Puerto Rico that offer STEM programs. And also they mentioned that only some of their students can mention the name of a Puerto Rican scientist. So there is a big opportunity for Bistimnista here, right, to um, offer 
this approach, we are mainly focused on STEAM education. However, this is not gonna be successful if we ignore these other aspects, right? Self-identity, community, and careers. So BSTEAMNista is gonna offer four workshops to teachers, right? Our main target is teachers. And the first workshop is gonna be focused on helping them develop culturally relevant lessons and integrating arts in uh, STEM. The second one is focused on self-identity. So incorporating Puerto Rican STEM professionals who can self serve as mentors for the students. Then we have the third one, who's, which is gonna be focused on science policy. So showing the students, right, and uh, first the teachers how to do this, and then the students, showing them how they can use science as a powerful tool to solve problems in their communities. And the fourth workshop is gonna be focused on careers in STEM or opportunities in STEM to increase awareness. Yes, in the island, there are several organizations doing an amazing job trying to uh, encourage and uh, increase STEM awareness. However, most of their target population is graduate students or undergraduate students. Bistimnista wants to get inside the classrooms, right, from these younger uh, students, and we want to have a direct collaboration with teachers, particularly from middle and high school, um, having them uh, provide more culturally relevant lessons to their students so the students can actually see the applicability of science in their daily lives. And this way, we're also going to increase um, STEM education and career awareness. During SAI, uh, Bistimista has been able to accomplish several milestones. We developed a survey uh, which helped us define, better define the problem. Then we work on uh, these prototype logos. Um, I also already bought the domain and uh, website builder, so I'm currently working on my website. And we were happy to see that five out of the seven educational regions in Puerto Rico are represented here in these, um, is the data that I have presented, shared with you today. There are many future goals, but at the moment, the most important one is to develop the activities and workshops as well as the website. Uh, in the future, we want to formalize uh, a team. We also will consider transitioning to a nonprofit or LLC organization, depending on how this uh, grows. And then at the moment, we don't need that much uh, uh, funding in order for us to, to function. However, um, in the future, I do, I'm ambitioning um, applying to grants or particularly developing some sponsorships and collaborations. With that, I want to thank Fanuel, Jasmine, my mentor, and in general, SAI staff and fellows for sharing your knowledge and um, great ideas. Uh, please remember Bistimnista, making science culturally relevant. Um, I'm looking forward for um, collaborations. Send me an email, you can find me on LinkedIn. And if you want to learn just a little bit more of what I've been doing in Puerto Rico with K-12 education, you can scan uh, this QR code and you'll find one of our publications. And with that, I'm open to questions. Thank you. Very nice. I like QR codes. So if you have a phone, scan that thing right now. Uh, judges, you got time for one question. I can throw one in quickly. Nisha, um, tell us about your metric. Any, what's the key metric that you will be looking towards as you launch this program? So I have a few. First of all, um, teachers that are participating and then which towns in Puerto Rico are represented, right? Depend with those teachers. And then as they develop the lessons, we wanna use basically how they're gonna evaluate the students in the classroom and also how many um, outcomes based on the different workshops, outcomes from the students. So activities, for example, talks or projects that the students develop. And I would like to showcase those in the website. So all those things taken into consideration. And uh, something that I've always encouraged the fellows to keep in mind is this is a development process, very iterative. You're gonna get more data, you're gonna adapt very Bayesian way of thinking, right? So you are definitely gonna adapt and it's critical that you are flexible in your thinking. And if you get new data that tells you to go in a different direction, you should listen to that information. Uh, it's critical that you do so. Uh, 
Thank you so much, uh, Nisha. Mm -hmm. uh, up next, uh, Robin from Johns Hopkins. Okay, so everyone can see and hear this? Yes. All right, so I'm excited to talk to you today about lady lab rats. And this has really come about from headlines like this. We've all seen this, people not following COVID guidelines, people not wearing masks. And also it's not just that they don't wanna follow it, it's that they're angry about it. They're adamantly opposed, there's actually protests. So I really wanted to know where this breakdown and communication was happening between science and people. So a little bit about me before I tell you what I think the root of this problem is. Um, I'm an aspiring physician scientist. I'm studying pharmacology at Johns Hopkins. So my career is gonna be communicating science to the public. So this is something that I'm really passionate about. And I was having a conversation one day with the chair of my department and some other students. And we were talking about conspiracy theories and people that don't wanna wear masks. And we were trying to figure out where it's coming from and also if it's too late to reach people like that. Like a scientist obviously would wanna throw more data, more facts, more numbers. And that doesn't seem to be the solution to the problem. There's something more complicated going on. So I think it really boils down to trust. And my hypothesis is that this breakdown in trust between society and science is really happening at a younger and younger age because there's less and less science curriculum being pushed at the elementary level. And we see the big effects of this. Um, as people grow up. So looking at trust in science, there's a lot of things that play into it. There's the level of science education you have. There's also this history where some groups have been marginalized and abused by science in the past. Um, and then you have people that say they trust science, but if you look at issues that have become politicized like environmental science, their vaccines, you start to see disparities. And then there's also a familiarity aspect. If you ask people if they trust doctors, for example, they're about 30% more likely to say that doctors have people's best interest in mind or that what they're saying is reliable than research scientists. And that kind of makes sense because people see doctors, they know what they do. Research scientists are kind of this ambiguous group that people don't have much exposure to. And then there's also the representation aspect. If you're exposed to this Eurocentric curriculum where you see a few white male scientists, you don't see anyone that looks like you, you don't see people that come from your background, it's harder to relate to and trust that group. So it looks like this is really an issue when you look at like the general adult population, but is it a problem like I thought with elementary school students? So I polled about 220 elementary school students, K through five, and we asked them if they trust or don't trust scientists. And this pretty clearly mirrors what's going on with adults and that we saw this 50-50 breakdown in students that said they trust scientists. We also were looking at this um, aspect of exposure to diversity. So we had them draw what they think a scientist looks like. And in a school where the demographics are about 50-50 male, female, and also there's a, a 15 to 20% minority population, almost all of the drawings were white male scientists. So clearly even at like six to 10 years old, there's already this stereotype of what a scientist looks like developing in these students' minds. So my solution to this problem is that students become investigative science journalists. So Lady Lab Rats is actually um, a product of the students. They came up with the name, they drew the logo. We had a graphic designer work with us to make it a little more streamlined. Um, and these are two of the students that have helped us pilot the program. And this is them interviewing uh, the chair of my department. The overall outline of this program and the people that have been really instrumental in helping me make it happen so far. Um, so first, we want to institute an application process. So this is to put evaluation right up front. We can talk to the students about what their views are, where they're coming from, what level of skill they have, what they think scientists look like. Um, and then we have them work with our, she's actually a news anchor. So she's worked with the students on how to do a good interview, what to expect, things to really avoid. And then we really wanna have this emphasis on the scientific method. So why the things they've learned about asking questions are important to science. And then they should understand why like changes in mask mandates come about with more empirical evidence. And then their final project is gonna to be to do these interviews. I think this program is really valuable because if you look at this space, there's a lot of just ask a scientist programs, but they're not really student driven. So we've done about five, 
five of these interviews and they've been 25 to 30 minutes. The students have come up with all of the content. So I think that's pretty impressive for students that are nine years old. If you give them the power to do it, they really can. So we're hoping to really increase what I call healthy skepticism. So obviously we don't want them to just blindly believe what scientists are saying either. Um, but we don't want there to be this barrier where they, they don't trust science, so they don't even feel motivated to look into it. So through this program, when they're looking into scientists, they're looking into what the scientists do, we hope that they'll have the confidence in their research skills to go out and find good information. And the response from teachers so far has been overwhelmingly positive. They've all said that they think that this could benefit their students, improve their students' thinking, and that they see a place for this in their classroom. So my vision of how Lady Lab Rats will evolve, right now we're very much in this pilot phase. Like I said, we've only worked with about 10 students. Um, we don't have very many resource demands, but hopefully as this grows, we can go towards nonprofit status so that we can really take advantage of the grant funding opportunities. And the teachers that I've been working with have gotten something like $70,000 in STEM grant money in the last uh, few years. So I definitely have good partners to help with this. So our next steps, um, I really love the Lady Lab Rat. Um, the logo is cute. This, the students had a lot of involvement in making it, but in the future, we probably want to be more inclusive. Um, and then we're definitely going to focus on instituting all of the evaluation things that we've learned through SAI. And then from a program development per perspective, it's really just nailing down the curriculum. And then one of the exciting things, we're hoping to pilot a middle school program where the scientists will actually pose a challenge to the student, the student will research that problem, they'll develop their own opinion, and then they can sit down and talk to the expert about it. So if you wanna help us build back trust between science and the public, reach out to me. If you're interested in being interviewed, we're always looking for scientists that would be excited to talk to the kids. So this is our website and uh, a Gmail address. Fantastic, uh, I think there's some, some excitement out there, people, sending you claps and so forth. Um, okay, uh, Peter has already fired one, one away. Uh, how are you reaching students, integrating into schools or students self-selecting or teachers self-selecting? Yeah, so I, I know a few teachers personally. So we started working with their classrooms and then they talked to the other students or the other teachers in their school. And then it's actually spread. So I've had responses from teachers in middle school and high school. Great. Um, any other questions? Okay, so um, oh, let, me, let me jump and ask one quick question if I can. All right, go ahead, detail. So I liked how you um, outlined the cultural um, kind of, um, you know, uh, connection between how how scientists are viewed. Well, how do you have you also thought about how, like, culturally, you can introduce this in a way that doesn't feel like um, uh, like it's pushing something that 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 is also you know aware of the culture of science that is kind of introducing in that way. I don't know if that makes sense, but you know, looking at um, how the the curriculum is culturally relevant to the area. Like, let's say if you're in Alabama and, and introducing a program versus if, in New York, if you are in New York City, have you thought about some of those um, differences? Yeah. So right now we've only worked with. So we piloted in West Virginia, so um, a pretty small rural area. Um, I'm currently in Baltimore, so I definitely want to reach out to teachers and see what their perspective is in a more urban school and see like maybe what the challenges are in, in incorporating something like this with their set curriculum. But I'm hoping that from a diversity perspective that since we're building these kind of one-on-one -on -one relationships, that it'll, it'll come about in a more organic way. Thank you, uh, Robin. Okay, moving along, um, uh, Shafiq uh, from University of College London. Welcome, and a special note, he was one of my mentees. No pressure. Uh, um, thank you, Fenel. So, hello everyone, my name is Shafiq. I'm the founder of um, Inquiry Lab. So, Inquiry Lab is a research-based uh, professional development program, um, mentorship for science teachers. So, I'm from, um, obviously from, um, Sorry, let me. So I'm from Malaysia and um, a Southeast Asia country. So seven years ago, I moved to the UK to continue my studies and I completed my PhD in science education at the um, University College of London, UCL, and now um, I am in my third year postdoc. So why I initiated um, Inquiry Lab? Um, there have been a few studies 
um, actually quite a lot about the problem um, regarding science teachers lack like understanding of the scientific inquiry process. Um, in Malaysia, uh, particularly, we have lack of professional development program on the pedagogic scientific inquiry process. So before this, I have spoken to the uh, teacher educators and then the teachers themselves. Um, and then I found that the majority of the teachers in Malaysia do not have time and do not know how to engage with uh, pedagogic research. In fact, there are very limited resources that teachers can engage um, with pedagogic and educational research. Sometimes the academic language used in articles and public research are difficult to read. Um, basically, in reality, there are a huge gap between research and practice. The educational um, research typically undertaken by researchers or scientists is unlikely to inform practice. This is why Inquiry Lab, sorry, this is why Inquiry Lab attempted to fill the gap by inviting science teachers to engage with research, with the mentorship from the researchers and collaboratively develop a scientific curriculum to inform the practice. There is a five step process that the teachers will involve in the program. The process is based on the curriculum development process uh, phases, which will take around three to six months. In each cohort of the program, three to four teachers will be mentored by a researcher online electronically. In the process, the teachers will be collaboratively develop a set of lesson plan, trial the lesson plans in their own context of classroom and evaluate the lesson plan based on the uh, trial. Yes, there are so many uh, professional development program for teachers out there. But unlike um, the typical uh, professional development program that is um, normally practice-based, sometimes unrelated to what teachers need, um, deliver in a unidirectional format and solitary, Inquiry Lab is a research-based professional development program that emphasizes a contextual, bi-directional because the teachers will create the curriculum themselves and then the program itself is a collaborative in nature. Thus far, I have launched the program through the website um, inquirylab.org, which is uh, live today. Um, the first call of the program is launched um, last month, which is three teachers are recruited uh, from this three school. They are currently producing five lessons plans based on the research evidence. In addition, um, 87 children will be benefited from the program when the lesson plans are um, implemented. So Inquiry Lab um, will be registered as a charity organization in the UK and Malaysia. Therefore, the funding model will be the format of grants and donation. I am to apply from uh, national and international organization. In fact, we are um, the top 10 uh, for the Australian um, Southeast Asia Award. Um, at the moment, I'm the solely founder and a mentor for Inquiry Lab, hence I aim to hire and educate the members to execute this idea. I also aim to hire mentors to facilitate the teachers in the future cohort program. In addition, Inquiry Lab plan to organize um, a weekly um, webinar um, and post on the social media to engage science teachers with pedagogy research. The next step of Inquiry Lab is to extend the program within the Southeast Asia context so that the teachers the science teachers within uh, this uh, continent um, can collaboratively create a scientific curriculum. Finally, I would like to thank to the SAI, especially my mentor panel for encouraging me to expand this program. Please get in touch uh, with me if you like further information. We are also on Facebook and Twitter, so please like us and follow Inquiry Lab. Thank you very much. Fantastic, uh, judges. Yeah, I guess, well done. Um, where, like, how do you plan on recruiting teachers and like, um, what would be like an ideal candidate to, to be a part of this program? Um, I'm, I have a lot of connection with science teachers manager through various organization and, and also within the Southeast Asia contract in general. So I plan to uh, publish an application so that the teachers can apply if they want to get involved with the research. Um, also, uh, we would like to expand more within the uh, suburban and indigenous school. This is where the first call of the program uh, came from uh, suburban and indigenous school. Awesome, thank you. Great, okay, so we, uh, we're almost there, two more, and then uh, we'll get some, uh, some updates from our judges. Uh, Yefe, uh, Yefe is coming to us from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Yefe, welcome. All right. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Let me share my screen.
All right, you can see the slides? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I guess before I begin, I just want to acknowledge uh, Girl of Lean, my mentor in the program. Um, thank you for being a tremendous thought partner on, on our concept. Um, okay, so hello everyone. My name is Ife. I'm the co-founder of Third Room. Um, Third Room is a social network platform that harnesses the power of social capital to drive student interest in STEM careers. Um, I like to begin this presentation with a, a story. Uh, this is my mom and I when we first came to the US about two decades ago. Uh, I'll be honest, my grades were really bad around this time, right before I came. So I wanna share a story of what turned things around. So we lived in a small apartment behind this house, you see. Uh, behind this house was a, a church parking lot. I used to love riding my bike there. And one day I met someone who introduced me to the church. So I went to church and at church I met someone who gave me my first job ever. And that was just cutting bushes. And that person introduced me to somebody else who said they needed my help in Biloxi after Hurricane Katrina. They called these things mission trips. And gradually my grades started to improve because I felt I had purpose. And I was also meeting other people who also had purpose. Now my story is not unique for millions of young people. It's not just what you know, but also who you know. This is the core premise of social capital. It's the invisible currency of education reform and we need more of it. Now, what if I told you that social capital can be harnessed to tackle one of the most prevailing challenges in education, which is broadening student participation in STEM? Now, we all know about the STEM shortage. Now, recent studies have shown that students are losing interest in STEM. The reason isn't so much on what teachers are doing or not doing, but rather on the lack of exposure with real people who do the work. So our solution is fairly straightforward. We reveal and unlock the power of social capital by exposing students to real people who do the work. Our platform allows high school students, teachers, industry professionals, not just scientists, to connect with one another for on-demand interactions, mentorships, and networking. We also use AI to help make curated matches between users, which will result in more meaningful interactions. Now, in terms of what else is out there, I'll say that existing solutions are either not appropriate for this purpose or aren't scalable enough to impact every student at the frequency that they need. So when I think of scale, I, I think of this a lot. How will we reach 3 million high school students in this country? Now, in the top right category, there's an um, uh, organization called Shaper. Uh, they are very close to us in concept. People call Shaper the Tinder for entrepreneurial networking, but it's very niche. It's made for entrepreneurs. It's not student friendly. I recommend that you all take a look at it because it's it's really progressive in, in how they built their um, how they built their app. Uh, in terms of sustainability, you know we're a SaaS enterprise business. We charge employers for the hosting, content, and training to bring their employees and their brand onto our platform. These estimates here are, are based on ongoing conversation with employers. Um, so you might ask for employers, what's their value add? It really falls along two dimensions. One is the business value. Uh, if they can leverage the analytics from our platform to inform their broader uh, recruitment strategy. The second is largely out of a social mission to create stronger ties to the community through education and also find kind of low lift ways to increase uh, employee volunteerism. Uh, in terms of traction, last year we did two pilots in partnership with several rural districts and MassBioEd, uh, which is a, a local foundation that represents the life sciences sector. Um, in these pilots, we brought together professionals from 12 uh, biotech firms and about 300 students just to see what would happen when they interact. We did very limited planning, development of curriculum. Um, by the end, we saw 43% increase in students who reported greater interest in STEM careers, and that was only after three interactions. Um, earlier this year, we started planning for a third pilot um, to get 1,000 students to start interacting with the actual platform. Now, these findings affirm um, our hypothesis. This abbreviated logic model links our core activities to uh, exponentially increasing the number of interactions that students will have with real STEM professionals. There's a lot of stuff in the outputs bucket that I can certainly talk more afterwards. Um, ultimately, this will result in greater intention and persistence in uh, future STEM pathways. So my co-founder is uh, Downey Meyer. He's an AP bio and CS teacher at Mohawk Trails, which is the most rural district in Massachusetts. Uh, he is always looking for outside connections he can make for his students. You know, this need is not him alone. We also have a team of passion, people with passion, expertise to turn our concept into a permanent force multiplier for teachers and students. Uh, 
In terms of next steps, we'll release a prototype in June. Um, we've arranged two high school classrooms to test this prototype um, in the first week of June. Um, by end of this, this year, my goal is to get two to three employers or organizations to sponsor like a second build out. You know, this June release is gonna have very limited features. It's just gonna allow us to get further validation on the direction we're headed. Um, you know, if you wanna test the prototype in June, you can email me directly here from the slide. You can visit our website. Uh, we're also looking for connections to employers and organizations that um, have been looking to find ways to sort of impact education, but maybe they're sort of on the cusp of deciding, you know, what should be the best entry point. And we believe we can be that entry point for them. Um, so thank you all for your support. And I welcome your questions at this time. Great. Uh, judges. As you're thinking, I'll, I'll, I'll say something real quick. Um, so I, I think this is a really neat idea. I'm curious. I am I am I have three little kids. The oldest is about to turn nine. And so I recognize that social media and all these things change really fast. And I'm curious how you're going to get buy in from not so much the business folks, but from the, the student population and how you plan to market yourself to them. Yeah, I mean, you know, before I came to grad school, I was a product manager at a company called Nearpod, where, you know, we were in urban, rural, big districts. You know, I've come from that world. And the first thing, the short answer is it comes down to the value. You have, if you can, if I can prove the value, there will be usage. Um, the second thing, like tactically, would be partnerships. Um, you know, we partner with the Massachusetts Rural Schools Coalition that, you know, services 40 rural districts. And, you know, it's, it's hard to, you know, I can certainly one off do people that I know, but I, I think we have to go through these, these channels and honor the trust and legitimacy they built with those communities. Um, but so far, it's, it's not been too difficult to convince why this is important. And a lot of even like our pitches here today have, you know, we're scientists, we're professionals trying to make a difference and teachers have been receptive to that. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Yifei. Uh, all right. Um, last but not least, Zhou Ying. Welcome. And she's from UC San Diego. Okay. Can everyone hear me and see my slides? Yes. Hello, everyone. Oh, thank you for staying with me. My name is Zhou Ying, and I finished my undergraduate in winter, and I will start my chemistry PhD program in the upcoming fall. So I took the time to reflect on my undergraduate experience as a chemistry major. It is a journey that's fruitful, but challenging because it was mostly self-navigated. I was like playing a hide and seek with the chemistry resources I need. And it was not because they were full of them, but they're hidden in places that are not obvious to Google. So now that I realize I have missed some of the resources that might be the most helpful to me simply because I was not aware of them at that time. Over the past month, I've put some of my major related struggles into a survey and shared it among my peers in chemistry. As the results show here, the struggles are common. However, is the, is the internet really lacking the first person stories or career advice to chem, chem majors? Well, a quick Google search gives us multiple resources that have featured articles in careers and the people, not to say there's also YouTube videos. So what is the real problem? Why there is an overwhelming numbers of rabbit holes we can dig, but we still feel like we're playing hide and seek. I say that we're not aware of these resources because they're not centralized. I'm not some types of software engineer at Google who works to optimize the Google search engine, but what I can do is to bring the resources in one place and bundle them by category. So the camp folder is my proposed solutions to centralize and organize the available resources in chemistry for emerging chemists in college to navigate their study. In the camp folder, resources that are all scattered over the internet will be kept in one place and in an organized way 
such that our users could pinpoint the resource they need. And we're making progress. So I created a website, collected a pre-launch survey, and launched a database of Chemist Run project last week. It's updated at a current speed of one per day. And more excitingly, the stories of these project creators on the list will be part of my native content. And I was a student news writer before. And I really love the opportunities to connect with some of the great minds in chemistry and science communication. And I hope you do too. We will constantly evaluate our progress and success using statistics and survey response. For one thing, our users' interests will also decide our original content. We will pull and tailor our stories to the need of our users. Because the camp folder is volunteer based, we generally have a low demand for funding. However, to plan ahead for spending such as on the website upgrades and some appreciation gifts to my team members, these are some potential funding models the camp folder will live on. Right now, there is only me on the team, but these three areas are the major recruitment with a big welcome to our future content contributors. Ultimately, our the original content is the key driving force to get the camp folder moving forward. With that, thank you for your support and I look forward to talking to you soon. And as my closing statement, I want to thank my mentor Fannode and SAI for the support and the opportunity for me to share my idea here. Sounds communication would not be possible without the idea getting heard. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Zhou Ying. Um, okay, so the full floor of questions is available. Uh, judges, you feel free to stay here and ask questions away. Uh, otherwise, uh, you're welcome to join the breakout room for the judges and you guys can conjure together um, and decide your top two uh, pitch presenters. And I will uh, appoint Pete as the one that will announce. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Pete. <laughs> At the end of this, once you guys come back, um, you will um, hopefully peek and can make the announcement. But so I'll give you guys, let's say, uh, less than five minutes, if that's okay. I've seen you guys making progress in your reviews, so this sh it should be shouldn't be too bad. Um, so okay, um, let me know if you have issues going to the breakout room. But otherwise, the full floor is open now. If you guys want to ask questions to any of the presenters that have gone today, both in the chat and also uh, to them, please raise your hand so that I can make sure that I I can point to you as well. Uh, but this is a great job for everybody. I'm having trouble getting into the breakout room. <laughs> okay, I can I can send you. Uh, Brie, can you help send St Stephanie there, please? If you can. Uh, let's see. Alrighty. Think. Okay, I think they're all there. Fantastic. Um, okay, yeah, questions, please. I'm seeing comments here for all our presenters. This was great. Um, let's see, I can read some more. Um, yeah, this was great. Fantastic job, everyone. Great projects, and I echo that too. Um, yeah, any other questions? And use the, okay, uh, Matt. Okay. Hey, yeah, this, this was uh, just a really exciting uh, slew of projects. So um, great job, everyone. Uh, I had a question for Caroline. Um, I really like this uh, idea of the interact, well, just sort of increasing the interactive nature and kind of like more meta experience at a museum uh, where, you know, the visitors are actually contributing to the display. I think that's really cool. And there's just very few opportunities for that. Um, I was just wondering logistically, how do you choose who goes up on the wall or <laughs> uh, which ones are put on display? And like, you could very quickly fill up a wall. So like, just, you know, what do you envision for how this would look? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Caroline. Thanks. So I think that, well, definitely the um, exhibitor, um, the organizer of exhibits, she does have 
some veto power over what actually goes up in her museum, of course. Um, but and, and she was most concerned with um, the the science that is the content of the zine. Um, but she's open to virtually having a display for everyone. And yes, um, you could get pretty cluttered. And the other idea is that we could also do more of like a augmented reality sort of um, tour through museum where there could be QR codes <laughs> that you would scan and around different specimens, say, and then like here's a, you know, here's like two zines about orangutans. Now just pop up for you. Cool. Yeah, something to note here as well, there's a lot of collaborative potential uh, yeah. that you have noticed. And that's something that we, as you all know, at SAI, we really encourage collaborations. Uh, and uh, it's great to see all the, I think a lot, many of you had slides of people you're working with, you know, organizations that you're gonna reach out to. Out to. But that's, um, I think that's a really important thing for everyone to keep in mind, the power of collaboration. Um, other comments or questions? So a question for Zhou Ying, um, key metric, can you point out, and, and this I will throw out to a couple of you in the rapid fire. So key metric, Zhou Ying. Yeah, so there are some most basic ones such as the number of book points, uh, number of content contributors, but ultimately we really want to get into um, knowing if our users do get an increase in their knowledge base. And if they do find they, they're more aware of the chemistry resources around them. So this will be done through survey response. Yeah, the trouble there for you will be trying to figure out the, your user base, I think, um, capturing them at the beginning and keeping them kind of a, a pre and a post situation. That will be, I think, tricky, but not impossible, but tricky. Um, let's see, I'm gonna ask uh, key metric, Caroline. Okay, great. So what's great is that um, the students will actually be hopefully leaving me a copy of their zine. And uh, one thing that we can do is I've developed a rubric to see whether or not they implement some of the um, visual communication techniques that we'll hopefully be teaching to the students. And so that already would be a way for us to, I have a rubric to um, assess how effective it, this has been for the students. Great. Um, let's do Amanda. Yeah, so I think the, the main thing would be the number of participants that sign up for the program, but also another important metric would be the scales measured in our pre-post survey. So seeing how STEM identity change, self-efficacy, confidence, seeing change scores in, in those metrics as well. Great, and I'll do one more. Um, and Nisha, I think I may have asked you this before, but I'm sorry if I did, but key metric. Yeah, I got it before, um, but um, <laughs> one thing would be the amount of teachers, again, that I'm getting in the program, because that way I know, you know, which regions in Puerto Rico are being represented and how much of an impact the program can, can make. And then for the students, I want to know if they are engaged in building uh, collaborations or doing projects that include their, their communities. And then those projects will be highlighted in the website or showcased in the website. So that's a way to show that, yes, the students are now um, engaging more in science and using science as a tool to solve other problems beyond the classroom and beyond things that are done in a lab. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's keep in mind as well, uh, a lot of these programs, I, don't, I know many of you think about a nonprofit status, as we discussed throughout the program, uh, fiscal sponsorship is another model and also plugging into another existing organization Right, you don't have to necessarily start everything from scratch all over and think about all the administration behind these things. You could be just trying to figure out, hey, this is a plug-in to your platform that already exists, right? So that's a nice pitch you can have to an existing organization that will be like, okay, this is great. Can we add you as a project in our portfolio? And yes, suddenly- example, you're, I was yeah. gonna share, for example, in my case, I'm a member of Ciencia Puerto Rico, which is mm -hmm. one of the biggest nonprofit organizations in, in the island. And I'm pretty sure they'll be happy to collaborate. Exactly. So that's strat strategy, you know, strategy for sure. Um, Amy, do you, do you want to just speak up a little bit? Go ahead. Um, I'll come back on. 
I just wanted to to echo your thoughts about finding places to plug in. And, you know, I spent a lot of years working in corporations and I think about the companies like 3M Company in Minnesota, right, that care so much about science, that doing all this research. I think they would be delighted to know about these kinds of programs and projects. And I think you could find support at the corporate level. So I was really glad to see um, uh, where did he go? I can't find him on my screen. <laughs> um, um, it was mentioned once to to look for for corporate support. So just wanted to reinforce that as a strategy. Yeah, something that we've relied on as well, collaboration and bringing people together and plugging into things um, for sure. The other place to look also is uh, um, science museums. I think that they will be really interested in almost everything I heard about today because the desire to help students see the value of science is something many of them focus on. And there are many, many science museums to, to look at as potential collaborators as well. Yeah, there is a need. And many of you highlighted the landscape, right? There's a lot of existing opportunities that are either mimicking what you're doing very close to, slightly different. Um, that, that's good, I think. It keeps you in check. It keeps you thinking about what's different about what you're doing and collaborate. So definitely, it's it's not a it's really a threat um, if you added that to your SWOT analysis, for example. So, <laughs> um, for sure. And I just want to congratulate you on your presentations. It was great to hear your stories and see your visuals and see some of you incorporate some of the techniques we've had a chance to talk about. So it was awesome. Yeah, thank you for that. Okay, so we have about, uh, I've heard that they have another 30 seconds to go, all right? And they'll come back and Pete will uh, say the piece. I think all the other men uh, mentors are, fingers crossed, Matt is there. I, I see if my mentee wins. <laughs> um, yeah, we're all team. winners. They're well. all winners, yeah. You're all winners, of course. Of How course. do you pick yeah. one out of a group of already winners? <laughs> And it's not really uh, winners per se. This is really about just celebrating you all, right? And giving you a boost to keep going, right? And then this is this is the nature of this um, sort of landscape is you have to keep going. You face stumbles, you face people saying no. You get a bunch of yeses too, by the way, you will. And that's that's the nature of this game. So find people in your corner that will boost you. And we hope that SCI has given you a a little bit of a boost. And uh, we're gonna definitely keep track of you all because we wanna make sure at six to 12 months from now, you're all still alive, right? Your pro projects at least, right? So we're definitely gonna be keeping an eye on that. Um, okay, so uh, if there are any other questions, please go ahead. I'm gonna see if I, we can bring them back. Um, I don't know if we have time, but I had a, I had a quick question for Jackie uh, that I asked in the chat, but I was just wondering if you'd used Seek, which I am a huge, huge fan of that. If you all don't have this on your phone, it's like kind of life-changing. It's like having Darwin in your pocket. Um, Seek by INAT, it like uses machine learning to identify like plants, uh, but also like insects and, and things like using machine learning. So. Yeah, that's really absolutely cool. fantastic. I think I sent you a private message. I should have done that in, oh. in the full chat, but yes, absolutely. Uh, Seek is fantastic. It's super cool. And with that, tied into that idea of partnering with a larger organization, your recommendation of um, encouraging students to use iNaturalist with this activity is is perfect. And that's I think that's a really great pairing because then it brings people to iNaturalist and then starts to thinking about, oh, what I could identify this plant too. That's really cool. Like, uh, that's that's a fantastic recommendation. I wrote it in my notes. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely want to chat. So I'll email you. For sure. And for those of you who went earlier, please drop your URLs to your projects in the chat. People can visit if they're already live out there. Um, Amanda, I don't know if you saw a question from Niba and Rosario way at the beginning. The question was, could you explain a bit more just about the training modules and what they will include, just some more specifics? Yeah, sure. Oh, thank you. I didn't see that one from earlier. Um, but yeah, so for each of the training modules, 
what I was thinking for developing the, uh, the coursework for it was to focus on each of those different content areas. So um, teaching grad students about STEM identity and the intersection of multiple identities and really focusing on reflection and application. So reflecting on the multiple identities that we all have and how that's contributed to us as scientists and then have actionable activities where they can apply some of the things that they've been reflecting on and incorporating them into their stories for that final product. So the coursework, obviously, I'm still developing that um, as, as I go along, uh, but those are some of the initial things. Great, uh, thanks for that. And another one more comment uh, from Niba earlier on was really thinking about strategic partnerships with places like Skype scientists who have massive access to a large body of students. Many of you are working with that category, uh, reaching out to them and being a strategic partner as well. I think thinking broadly around that scope will be, just keep that in mind. You don't have to start completely from scratch and just do it all yourself. There are people out there that have access to some specific groups and you just have to pitch and you already have the material now to them about the value, as Yifei mentioned, the value that you're providing. And so with that, uh, I see the judges are back. Uh, I, I've, I heard that it was a tough, as always a tough decision. And we were discussing here, um, here earlier that you're all winners, as we said, everyone's a winner. Um, and all we're trying to do here is give uh, you all a boost, maybe a few of you are an extra boost. So Peter, um, or oh, I don't know if you have a different person that you guys agreed to, to share this. Do you no, want to you, share your insights? Yeah, you put it on me. So they said that sounds great. Uh, so no, um, so we we had a really hard time making this decision. And I know we're going to kind of pass the mic around, I think is what we kind of said we would do a little bit here. But um, we, we definitely had some some good discussion. And, and honestly, you guys all did a really great job. It was a lot of fun to watch these. They were really well polished presentations. It was clear you guys put a lot of time and thought into not only the projects that you're working on, but the presentation of those projects. So we really appreciated that. Um, with that two, the two that stood out to us and, and there were others that were right there as well. So I, um, this was a tough decision to make. Oh, Peter, so before you make, did, did, did Nital and Stephanie want to say something uh, before you make that yeah. announcement? Okay, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. We can okay. do that first. Yeah, yeah. So Nital, do you want to say if just your, yeah, just share any insights broadly to all of them? Yes, um, I want to first say tremendous, tremendous work, um, incredible pitches, well prepared. I definitely feel like this was not the first time uh, you guys have worked on your pitch and I, I could tell that you had to really choose the things that were in your pitch. So those were all the great things. I want to give you some feedback as someone that's not a scientist like, all, like, like many of you are. I would say here's some just tips on pitches. I do pitches for the events that I do and listen to a lot. So if your program, if your problem is limited or focused, then like try to paint the vision. What will the world look like if we solve this? Like it, you're kind of answering that question, so what? I, I know it sounds a little bit crude, but you're answering that for the, the judges because they may not be in your field. It, it may not be obvious to them. Um, so if like, so like for the Puerto Rico solution, I thought it was incredible. The story was incredible, but if you could, maybe extend that out, paint that picture. Imagine if we make cultural, culturally relevant um, education in this sector. Imagine if we expand that out to other cultures, what will the world look like? You know, And that way we can buy into that, we understand. If your problem is prevalent, I would say clearly, I, I, um, uh, clearly kind of connect with data points. So like with the civil engineering, that 20% um, statistic kind of pulled us all in, whether we know about civil engineering or not, we're all kind of pulled in. So those are ways that we start creating a, um, a common experience between no matter what background you're coming from. And I know this is a situation when, when you, if you're, if you know your judges are not from your same background, if they are, you don't, you might just need to, you can just cut to the chase of the very clear thing. Um, and then another just thought I had is like, um, if you're looking, cause a lot of these are impact ideas, which I love, you can kind of, you might like to tie some of them to the sustainable development goals by the UN, like, because those are already goals that are defined and saying, hey, this serves that goal that is already defined for by the year 2030 or something like that. So it kind of then aligns us again that we're like this, your solution is actually leading to this bigger goal that the world has identified that it has, or like, you know, the United Nations has identified. So I think that would be um, helpful. And um, yeah, and I think one last thing I would just say is that 
um, sometimes in your in the solutions, because many of them are um, online oriented, you maybe one next step further, and maybe if you have more time in your pitches, is to um, kind of um, anticipate what uh, uh, argument might be. So if it's on, if it's an online solution, you might say, well, you may be thinking, what about Zoom fatigue? And then you give a solution to that. Because right now, if everything is online, maybe people would be like, oh, but I'm, I can't even be online all day, you know? So maybe you can anticipate a little bit. And so then you, we know that you really thought through this, that it's not just another online solution. Um, but I'm so impressed. And if, if it's ever helpful to have a conversation, please reach out to me by LinkedIn or through Fenwell. But cheering you guys on. The world will be a better place if all of your solutions are incredibly successful. So thanks so much for sharing with us today. Fantastic. And then also the ability to work together too, Nital. We, we chatted about that earlier, collaborating. Uh, I think you can have a huge impact. Uh, Stephanie, uh, thoughts from you? Yeah, as like a fellow student entrepreneur, um, I think I'm like super inspired. I'm like, you know, I, I want to kind of revisit my own business model and and just kind of uh, apply to the things that I've learned. I think it's just like a, a general tip is just like, you know, this a lot of this is just very still the early stages of like what you're envisioning your business to be. So like, don't be afraid to kind of pivot. And as you continue to get more feedback, kind of re reevaluate what that looks like and, 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 and really gravitate towards, you know, what, like, what can, like, what is a bigger vision of what you guys initially planned for and continue to take advantage of the mentors and the networks that you're a part of, even through SAI or through your university um, so yeah, just keep, keeping, keep refining and keep chipping away and it will slowly evolve into something bigger. Fantastic. And so with that, Pete, all up to you. All right. I, I'm also going to add one more thing. And I know that you mentioned at Fanuel that like, that they've been working on this. And I know from the process that you're working on this, but always knowing what assessment you are doing to make sure that what you're doing is actually successful or doing the things that you say it's doing. Um, so always being aware of how to do that and thinking about that. Um, with that being said, our two um, selected projects and, and SAI fellows um, are uh, Jackie, oh man, Jackie Wisenant. I don't, I think I slaughtered that, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> it's really fine, w Wisenant. <laughs> Wisenant, thank it's you. It's not spelled the way it's pronounced, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with the Insect Adventures and uh, Kate Thompson with the Courageous Coders. So congratulations to both of you. Your pitches were incredible and your projects look like they are going to, to go phenomenal places as are honestly all of the pitches that we saw. <laughs> so great work. That's fantastic. Yay. Congratulations uh, to you all, to you all. Okay, yeah, um, to getting here today, I'm just so, I'm filled with so much excitement and, and happiness that you all are here. And judges, thank you so much for taking the time to do this and appreciate uh, your insights. And as I promised, I wanted to share with you all some special news regarding the uh, sixth cohort. So I will do so at this time. And so with that, again, thank you all. Uh, this was a great um, event. And the special announcement is that Cohort 6 will be launching this fall, okay? We're going to be launching the sixth cohort. We're going to be utilizing a lot of lessons from all the previous cohorts. Uh, as you all know, I think of this uh, as a vehicle, a spaceship. And every time we knew a different iteration, we add new computers, new engine, and hopefully we can scale higher. And so with that, we're going to be launching the application in July. And that's always an exciting uh, thing to know. So with that, thank you so much to you all. Um, have a great uh, rest of your afternoon. I will be sticking around for a little bit here if anybody wants to chat. Um, and with that, um, this concludes the fifth cohort of the SAI Fellows. Thank you everyone. And thank you to also Bree and uh, Claire for all the hard work at the behind the scenes. Thanks, everybody. Well done. Great job, everyone. Have a fantastic weekend, everybody. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everybody.